Okay. Well, the title of my talk is going to be related to magnetic calorics and some of the products and R&D that the Building Technologies Program is undertaking. And I titled this a zero GWP solution, where for those that aren't familiar, global warming potential. And I think in, it's been timely because GWP has been in the news. 20 countries, 200, over close to 200 countries, came together in agreement, part of the Montreal Protocol, about reducing HFCs and to uh, enable the half a degree, you know, for climate change related to, like Sam Rashkin talked about. And refrigerants are an important part. So before I go, and I brought a little magnet as one of my props, before we get into the magnetic calorics um, debate or talked about the challenges and opportunities that this technology has to offer, first we want to frame, you know, what's going on? What's Okay, it's not working. Oops. Okay, so what are we doing? Um, in the building technologies program, at least in my area, that I manage a portfolio related to HVAC, water heating and appliance, we're trying to create a paradigm shift. And if you look at my portfolio, we, we also take, very similar to Amir, we take a two-prong approach. Uh, one of the prongs is we work on technologies that are near term, but we also work on some of the technologies that are game changers. And some of these technologies are the ones that are the end state. One of the things that you probably read if you read some of those news articles related to the Montreal Protocol and the changes, they always talked about low. But then no, nobody ever talked about zero. And that's the main objective, that we're trying to enable a paradigm shift. We're trying to go after and develop the technologies that don't work about uh, global warming potential of 100 or 200, or like in the thousands of um, GWP that the current refrigerants have. We're trying to go to zero. And that's an important part to realize. And these investments, these technologies, are not just going to happen overnight. You know, in the building technology, we like to take a long-term aspect. You know, see what are the products, what are the technologies that are all actually going to be game changers. And these require some initial investments. And we started going down this road, um, and I'm only picking, talking about one of the calorics, and I'll talk about some of the other ones as one example. But when you look at it, you look at the problems, you look at the big energy savings opportunity. And one of the big things to realize is worldwide power consumption for air conditioning alone is forecast to surge 33 um, fold by uh, 2100 as developing world's um, incomes rise and urbanization advances. They shouldn't be doing what we did. How we got here today is not acceptable. You know, it's like uh, Sam Rashkin, you know, talked about as being good stewards, being, uh, being able to come up with the next generation. They can't use the same methods that we used. So there are some new opportunities, new technologies that can change things. And I talked a little bit about the Montreal Protocol, but in 2014, the United States, Canada, and Mexico proposed an amendment to the Montreal Protocol. And actually, before I submitted the slides, this weekend is when they actually got together and committed to some major um, changes to that and adopted. And it's really going to make a big impact. But you know, to keep in perspective, this is a global solution. It's not just a U.S. problem, it's a global solution that we're talking about. Uh, when you look at the U.S., the U.S. historically has been a global leader in HVAC technologies. We have exported our technologies. So it's in our DNA to come up with the next generation of technologies. And HVAC phase-out is more technically challenging than prior refrigerant transitions. We have gone through several um, change out a phase down, so you want to go complete it uh, in the past. But in the past, it was a little bit easier. And in the past, there were always solutions that were there for the taking. You know, people knew, oh, we'll go there. And these solutions had certain characteristics that they made them acceptable. They're very similar. Uh, they didn't have any issues. Toxicity was not a problem. Flammability wasn't an issue. But you look at it today, and it's not an absolute ban of HFCs, 
but it's a phase down. And one of the challenges with this phase down is the options. The options are require some R&D. So the world, the near-term technologies, the ones that are readily available, the ones that we are very much used to based on refrigerants, and I'll talk about refrigerants later on in my talk, is that these refrigerants that are readily available have some shortcomings. But if you look, want to take a step back, and you ask, how did we get here? In the early days, you know, we didn't care. We didn't know much. We looked at refrigerants. You know, the first generation, what worked? You know, they worked great. We used them. Second generation, well, some safety issues came up, so we got there. And then the whole issue, when we got close to the HFCs, you know, ozone depletion came in to the picture. We were all worried about the ozone, and that was a major part. But now we're in the fourth generation, the low GWP. And in reality, I think there's going to be a fifth generation, the zero uh, GWP solutions. And each time you start screening, add more criteria, more filters, and, um, you know, it becomes more challenging because now there are fewer um, refrigerants to choose from. And earlier on in the department's uh, history, we played an active role in developing some of these refrigerants for some appliances and refrigerators. And earlier on in my career at DOE, we funded a study at NIST that actually closed the book on a study on refrigerants themselves that showed what's possibly out there. It didn't take into consideration mixtures and blends, but a lot of people that were holding out and hoped there would be a magic bullet, silver bullet, that was going to solve everything. You know, this magical refrigerant um, that was going to come out of nowhere and people would be able to solve all our problems. Lo and behold, it doesn't exist. So now we're in a phase that we can move on, march forward, knowing that there aren't any new refrigerants or any new compounds. There may be blends where you, just like cooking, you mix things together to get a lot of new things. The refrigerant world, you know, is very limited. And if you look at it, these are currently some examples. What are we using today? Well, for refrigerators, 134A is being used. Window air conditioners in some central AC units, very common. Uh, 410A, common refrigerants. And you can see these common refrigerants, uh, global warming potential, is very high in the thousands. That means that, you know, compared to CO2, CO, you know, um, CO2 that comes out, you know, the magnitude that being one as a relative from a global warming perspective, you know, they all have high multipliers. They also have very long life. That means when they get released uh, into the atmosphere, they stick around a very long time. So it isn't like in the old days that, um, you know, in the past when humans made pieces of equipment out of wood, you know, weather will degrade it and the wood would disappear. Some of these refrigerants, they uh, get vent out into the atmosphere and they stick around a long time. That's what gave us our first indication that the ozone layer was disappearing. Holes started, scientists were informing us that these holes were appearing. And part of it was that those refrigerants that were being released had a negative impact on the world, and they were just sticking around. There were a reason why they were so inert and so safe for us, but they didn't decompose into its basic elements. And if you look at potential future GWP, you know, refrigerants, low flat, you know, if you look at these candidate uh, blends or different refrigerants, you'll see one thing that a lot of them have. Yes, they are going lower from a global warming potential, but you see that they have some trade-offs. And the major trade-offs are, a lot of these are that they're flammable. So they're a price to pay. And a lot of these also would entail a lot of R&D to be dropped in replacements. So they're not the easiest uh, to implement. And their safety, like I said, the flammability. So there are a wide range of options. And these options are being pursued at this time to make them in the realm that manufacturers will feel comfortable uh, commercializing them. And here's one of the slides that I usually tell, talk to people when I explain to them what is a heat pump or an air conditioner. Because a lot of people look at it and they think it's like magic that's occurring. 
And it's not magic. You know, one of the things you realize is that when we develop these next generation of equipment, be it um, refrigerant-based or non-refrigerant, they sort of have some basic components. And this is where one of my props oops, comes in. I think most of you have, uh, maybe, maybe around your house, you may have a little can to clean your keyboard. And very few people know that this is actually a refrigerant. This is actually R152A. Um, it is a low GWP refrigerant. It actually was developed for the automotive industry. And the automotive industry did not utilize it. And the main reason they didn't utilize it was flammability. So that sort of moved them away. And now where is it? They're in shelves everywhere. And one of the things to realize, and I always use this as an example to see how the vapor compression cycle works is, I think most people have used it. And if you realize it, just like if you have here, it actually is extracting heat from the bottom and it's getting cold. This is very similar to what's happening in, in a heat pump or a, a vapor compression system. You extract the heat from the environment. You have a liquid. Something that's where the vapor compression comes in. You have a liquid that's expanding to a gas. And when it attracts the heat from the environment, you know, it provides the cooling. In a closed loop system that you have a cycle like in a heat pump or um, an air conditioner, you bring it back from that gas phase and you use a compressor to get it back into a liquid state. And that requires energy. One of the things that we talk about is we're not EPA, we're the Department of Energy. So we're an energy efficiency first organization. So um, whatever we do, it also has to be energy efficient to begin with. So you have the compressor, you get it back to a liquid, similar to the scan, you release it, you know, that provides the cooling or the extraction. Um, a heat pump works the same way ex except the condenser and evaporators get switched around. So you move the heat, like for cooling, you, br you take the heat that's inside of a building and you move it outside. For heating, you bring the heat that's outside and you bring it inside. So it's all about moving heat around, not actually burning uh, fuel or using electricity or something, the energy con contained in that fuel itself. So the other thing is, I want to tell people is, if you have one of these things, there is a lower solution. You can always use a handy brush to clean your keyboard. This, does, this is a zero GWP solution, so I highly recommend it. So now we go into caloric materials. And let me see. If, okay. Caloric materials are a class of materials that um, instead of having a refrigerant, they're solid state. And one of the things that makes them very uh, worthwhile pursuing with them is that when you have a vapor compression system, you have a vapor. And that vapor is very hard to keep inside the system itself. It, due to how operational needs, human error, maintenance, the refrigerant over time escapes. And that's where a lot of the Montreal Protocol issues comes in. It's in with these direct impacts to the, gover to the environment and the climate itself. These units, you know, these materials that are solid state based have the advantage of not being in a vapor themselves that can escape. When these vapors escape, these refrigerants, they make the, um, a large impact on our climate themselves. Caloric-based systems, coefficient of performance scale proportional to the magnitude of the caloric effect and inversely uh, proportional to the strength of the driving force. And I'll go into greater detail of the meaning to that. But all these materials have a driving force, these caloric materials, and have the benefits um, of caloric materials, and this is very important, is scalable. Um, right now, just like uh, you, when you drive a car, you know, the automotive companies, or be it, or even the HVC manufacturers, they developed compressors, and those compressors come 
in discrete sizes. Just like you buy a car, there's only a certain number of engines that a manufacturer will put in resources to develop. And it takes very intensive, a lot of resources. These materials that are um, solid state have the potential to be uh, scalable. So you can do a, a small amount and then scale it up and tailor the right capacity to the right load. Right now, most of the time, we size pieces of equipment and operate in their size for full load capacity when you may only operate a few hours or minutes out of the year. Then you have to partial load. Most of the time, they're operating at very smaller capacities. So you, they're incredibly oversized. So they're not very efficient. And their performance degrades over time. When something is based on the material properties themselves, they degrade in different ways. And potentially, they have the characteristics of being able to maintain performance over time. Caloric effects are maximized when a material is switched from a disordered into an ordered state or from one ordered state to another. And I'll have a, a slide resulting talking about that. And the resulting effects may be enhanced with first order effects, the simplest. Um, and I'm going to be talking about one of the magnetic, one of the caloric effects, magnetics, the ones that have a magnet to um, talk about. So the caloric um, materials, one of the things to realize is, in reality, there are just three basic fields that we work with. There are opportunities to mix mechanical with the electric and magnetics, but in reality, there are just three major ones. One with an electric field, and I won't go into uh, detail, but the electric field means that instead of using a magnet, you vary that electric field. There are some advantages to uh, some of these technologies, and we are pursuing them. Magnetic caloric, where the ones that I'm going to be talking about in a little bit greater detail, those are the ones that you have a magnetic field, and you vary that field. Most often, that means moving a magnet or moving the magnet around uh, in and out of the magnetic field to give you this oscillation. Mechanical, almost you stress it and unstress it, and that in itself results in a uh, change in temperature, thermal. And all three of these can be used together or individually, um, but those are the caloric effects or the caloric materials, and we're pursuing all three of them. Uh, and the main reason that I brought up you know, magnetic uh, caloric is that it's one of the more mature ones of the caloric ones. It probably has like a 30 to 20 year head start over the other calorics um, talked about earlier. It's the most mature. Um, it is an emerging technology. Uh, one of the things is that it's in mid-stage of R&D. That means that there are prototypes that we have built. Um, they may not be fully vetted yet for commercialization, but one can see that within the next three to five years, there should be some products being sold. Uh, there's uh, talk about one company in France uh, cool tech with a refrigerator that they're supposedly is for sale. It doesn't ha hasn't hit the market yet, but you know it just gives you an indication that people are talking about commercializing. So this is not science fiction. You know prototypes have been built. Uh, manufacturers are looking at potentially uh, producing these units at volumes, and but you know there's still um, a lot of R and D left to be made to make them to a level that consumers feel comfortable with them. And you may be wondering, you know, how does this caloric, magnetic caloric uh, work? You know, what is going on that makes it worthwhile? You know, what's actually causing this delta T? And the real issue is you have a material like gallium, uh, usually considered the baseline material. And you have this material on it, and you can see that you have this material and the electron spins are randomly sp spread out through this material. Then you put a magnet over this material by passing it, and then they aligned. So that in itself, this is like when you get to the B, they align themselves. But at the alignment, there's also a temperature. The temperature goes up. Then you use um, you use a working fluid, like a liquid or something, to remove that heat, this extra heat that came in. And then you remove the magnet. 
once you remove the heat, because right now it's a little bit above, they become the um, scattered again. But this time, the temperature will go lower than it was before it started. And that's where the cooling effect comes in. And then you just repeat the cycle by putting the magnet again, heats up, you remove that heat the plus up, and you can stage this. And by staging, by putting a, a bed of materials, because different materials will have different characteristics, you can actually go down as low as zero or even lower below zero. And you keep doing this over and over, and that's how you have a magnetic caloric uh, cycle. In the Building Technologies program, um, initially, and I'm just going to talk about two projects, is we first looked at magnetic calorics for refrigerators. Uh, during the Recovery Act, we funded a project with uh, General Electric. And that project actually was just focusing on the material discovery and usually coming up with these um, materials that could actually be used. And GE characterized enough uh, material discovery and identified certain materials that later on we were able to have a follow-up pro uh, project with Oak Ridge National Lab that we actually had one of their prototypes come into the building technologies and we invited all of the ERE to come and see how they were able to cool down a soda can. They were able to demonstrate that, yes, we can build a prototype, but there's still a lot of work to be done, not so much in the materials from the system integration. We've gotten very good at vapor compression. Vapor compression has been around for 100 years. We haven't fully... Um, maximized or optimized what the ideal physical configuration is going to be for a refrigerator, for the regenerator. So we're in the, right now in the components. The materials that have been identified earlier may not be the ideal, but they're good enough. And when GE was visited the Building Technologies Program, they stated that, you know, they believe the magnetic caloric has been a technology of the future. They believe that the technology can easily meet our current energy efficiency standards and is the cheapest solution for the future to be able to meet future regulatory um, hurdles related to meeting appliance standards requirements. So, you know, one of the things is, yes, we want to transition to these zero uh, low GWP solutions, but also industry fully understands its potential because there are costs associating Vapor compression, we're sort of plateauing from an efficiency point of view, but also from an environmental liability point of view. And these caloric materials open up the possibility to go to the next generation. And the next project, you know, we talked about refrigerators. Um, they actually will give you a boost over vapor compression, but for a window air conditioner, we know that the U.S. needs better air conditioners. And maybe magnetic caloric, it's not an ideal to scale up to full-size home units, but window units for the developing world and other countries may be a viable solution. One of the things that the innovation that came in from this project, it isn't so much the material play as a system. Um, most of the time, when you're passing the magnet, how you remove the heat becomes the real challenge to make a full working system. How do you move the heat, making it work? One of the advantages that vapor compression had is that you had um, not co-located. You had a heat exchanger, something that will extract the heat inside a home, and another component, like I said earlier, um, a condenser or an evaporator, depending if it's a heat pump or an air conditioner, outside your home, an outside unit. And those two are not physically located. But now you have a magnetic caloric material, or any of the calorics, and you're applying a field, and all these thermal exchanges are a point source. They're happening here, when in reality you want something to happen here and, and here. So designing a system and coming up with configurations, how you would make this system work, they're not trivial. And that's where Oak Ridge's innovation came in by ha not having some of the additional plumbing for these thermal exchanges, by having metal rods. And even though they have moved away from some of the principles of using rods, but physically coming up with physical configurations that actually can enable the use of these 
caloric materials in designs and concepts that we're just starting to pursue. And, you know, magnetic caloric, it probably you don't hear that much or any of the calorics in the news, but potentially they are the next generation of solutions. The solutions that are um, the zero, not the low, but go beyond to something that will be zero. And then at the end, we'll just be focusing on energy efficiency only and removing the environmental consequences of the direct emissions of these refrigerants. And if you want to read about any of our other uh, sophisticated projects, including some of the other calorics, you can go to the Building Technologies website in the HVAC Water Heating and Appliance. We have project write-ups for every single project so you can have additional information and peer review presentations. And you can always email me and I'll be able to guide you through that knowledge and see where that information could be found. That's it. Thank you.